Located in North Kivu province in the eastern region of the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Gorilla Rehabilitation and Conservation Education Center, known by the acronym GRACE, is the only sanctuary dedicated to the highly endangered Crowers Gorilla. GRACE's gorillas are a blended group of unrelated individuals. The one thing that they share is trauma. Each was rescued at a young age after poachers killed their families. Special care was needed to help them heal. And now through the webcams at Grace, we're presented with an exceptional opportunity to learn about them, support their recovery and welfare, and help to ensure the survival of their species. Hi everyone, this is Mike Fitz, the resident naturalist with Explore Nature Cam Network. One of my favorite cams on Explore.org is the Gorilla Cam located at the Grace Sanctuary. And during previous live chats about the gorillas at Grace, We've talked about Grace's community first approach to con conservation. And we'll probably touch on that subject again, but with my guests today, I would like to focus more specifically about gorilla group dynamics, gorilla care at Grace, and uh, talk about some of the individual gorillas that make the group at Grace so special. We have two guests for our program today. We'll hear an interview with Domus Kakuli Sangia, who is the animal care manager at Grace. He has many years of hands-on experience caring for the gorillas at the sanctuary. But first, let's bring in Dr. Katie Fawcett, who is the program manager for GRACE. She's here to discuss the gorillas and their conservation and also answer your questions. Katie, thanks so much for uh, joining me today, and it's great to speak with you again. Thank you ever so much, Mike. It's great to be here. Our, uh, our conversation with Dalmas is uh, recorded. However, Katie will be with us for the entire broadcast. So if you have questions about Grace and the gorillas, then please drop those in the comments and we'll, we'll try to answer them throughout the broadcast uh, today. Katie, though, uh, before we get to the conversation with Dalmas, I wanted to learn a bit more about gorillas and gorilla group dynamics. Uh, I know that they're social creatures, uh, you know, they, they live in groups, but how do these uh, groups form? Thank you, Mike. That's, a, that's an excellent question and really, really interesting one for gorillas. So a typical gorilla family group is very much like we see at Grace, the silverback, the adult male leading a group of female and their, their offspring. And um, how these groups form is that both males and females as they mature have the options to, to stay in the family group or leave um, to form or to join other groups. So. An adult female will leave, have the choice to stay or leave in the group when she's about eight or 10. Um, she might want to change group if the leader is her father, or she um, might want to um, uh, leave, she has, a, you know, there might, be an, there might be another reason why she wants to leave the group. The, ma the males, they mature a little bit later. So when they're around eight, 10, they become black backs so we can see a couple in um, the group at Grace right now. And then at 13, 15, when they become silverbacks, that's when they may choose to stay if they're tolerated um, in their family group, or they may wish to leave. And this time they wouldn't leave to join another group, but to spend a time in the forest as what we call a lone silverback that would be on their own, where they would hope to bump into another family of gorillas and attract a female to come and join them and to start a new family group. And how important is the, the group to the growth and health and, and welfare of wild gorillas? You said that there's maybe a period of time where, a, you know, like a silverback could be alone, but that seems to be sort of like the exception when you look at like their entire lifespan. Is that right? Yeah, and they're alone looking to form groups. So I think the, okay. the family group is really central to the gorilla social, social organization and the growth of the population, because that, that male gorilla is providing protection for the females and the offspring, so they can, more, more females, the more offspring he has, so the more the population um, can grow um, and recover from its, its current endangered state, status. Are these groups, uh cohesive in the sense that they may last for many many years you talked about how you know they some gorillas need many years to mature so i'm wondering also about like the cohesiveness of gorilla groups over time 
Yeah, so the family group itself is, is cohesive. So as females may transfer multiple times between groups in their, in their life, and that's kind of unique within primates to have females transferring between, between, between groups. The family group is, is consistent during the, the lifespan of the silverback, which you know, may be 30, 40, 40 years. Um, and the group will only disintegrate if that leader dies and there is no other silverback to continue that group. And in that situation, all the females would need to transfer to, to new groups. Um, and there's a risk involved with transfer. So gorillas, gorilla groups are known um, to practice infanticide. So that's if a female transfers with a young dependent infant, the adult gorilla, the silverback, may kill that infant. And that obviously is going to have a, an impact on the rate of growth of the population. So keeping these family groups cohesive and intact is, is, is key for population growth. And you did actually answer uh, one of the first viewer questions that came in during your last answer. Somebody was wondering about the average lifespan of a silverback gorilla in the wild. So 30 or 40 years. Uh, I do want to talk, though, a little bit uh, about the specific gorillas that we have at Grace. Um, and somebody did write in and was wondering how many gorillas are in this group. And I want to maybe attach that question to the one that I had for you um, in, my, in my notes here about uh, how did the gorillas come to have a home at Grace? So how many are in this group and how did they get there? So currently we have a gorilla family of 14 individuals. Here we go. We have one silverback, Kioma, two blackbacks, that's young adult males, Shamavu and Lubutu, and then some adult females and some, some well, I think our youngest right now is really a sub-adult, so a very young um, adult female, Lulingu. But all of these gorillas came to Grace as infants. All were less than three years old. All were rescued from the illegal wildlife trade um, and brought to Grace for rehabilitation um, with a view of one day potentially being able to release back to the popu uh, back to the wild population to support conservation efforts. And what is the process like for integrating a new gorilla into the Grace group? Yeah, so when the, when the gorillas arrived as infants, so as you said, Mike, in the beginning, they're all suffering from trauma. So the very first step is really to, um, on the rehabilitation, is the, um, the re rehabilitation of the social and the physical aspects. And that's kind of an intense pro process in the initial stages. So usually for at least a month, the infant during this period is provided with one-on-one -on -one care from two or three human caregivers that are present 24 7 24 hours a day seven days a week and they're also kept in quarantine so isolated from the other gorillas from the gorilla, the family gorilla group at, at grace um, to prevent disease transmission but also to allow that initial rehabilitation process and then once the gorilla is strong enough able to go on daily forest walks perhaps start searching for food on its own at that point the caregivers will take it so it can first of all see the gorilla family so they can have an interaction first through the fence and observe each other become comfortable with each other and then our caregivers that work closely and know the gorilla so intimately will decide if there's a female that could offer the role of the surrogate mother and then the next stage would be to interact the, uh, introduce the infant to the potential surrogate mother. And that would happen separate from the rest of the family group. And if that process goes well, the next is to introduce the mother and the, the infant into the, family, into the family group. So it's a very carefully monitored, slow, and, uh, and always led by the gorillas process. And it seems like it's been quite successful so far with um, with the group that you have at Grace. And that answer to your last question, Katie, I think is a great segue to the conversation that you had with Dalmas Kakuli Sengeha, who is the animal care manager at Grace. Katie has, as I mentioned before, graciously agreed to stick around for our entire program. So we'll be back with her to ask her more questions. But first, uh, let's turn to her conversation with Dalmas. I think everyone will really enjoy 
hearing about his work with the gorillas. So hello, Damas. Please, could you introduce yourself hello. to the audience? Okay, thank you. My name is Dalmas Kakule Siangeha, and I'm an animal care manager at Grace. Thank you, Dalmas. And you have many duties at Grace as the animal care manager. Could you tell us a little bit about what your job includes? Okay, my job includes many things. Being an animal care manager, uh, it's uh, many things. Uh, I overseeing the caregivers, uh, gorilla health, uh, gorilla health, and data collection. But I also work with other departments at Greece, like the education, the maintenance, the farmer, and uh, the communication. You know, uh, you know, if the education team have some uh, people which comes to visit Greece, I have to be there explaining them how things go with animals and what should we do. At the farm, I can advise them uh, which vegetable is preferred by the animals and then I can advise them uh, to grow the, the, this uh, vegetable which is a, a gorilla, they like it very much. Yeah, it's why I had really, I'm everywhere. Wonderful. And Dalmas, you've worked with the gorillas for a long time. Um, now the gorillas are mostly teenagers and adults at Grace, but you've helped care for them since they were infants and helped to integrate new infants into the group. So could you explain to us a little bit about the special needs the infant gorillas have and how you care for them at that time until they're healthy enough to join the gorilla family group? Okay, thank you for the question. Really, uh, infant gorilla needs special care. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, the gorillas we have here, they are rescued from the person which uh, they do the illegal hunts and uh, the poacher. So, when these gorillas are rescued, they come here at Grace. And then, when they come at Grace, they have to pass in the quarantine. And the quarantine means a house in which these gorillas spent 14, uh, 40 days uh, with a medical check and they stay there with uh, some caregivers. We look at the dedicated caregivers which spend all the time uh, 24 hours hands-on and they can even mm -hmm. sleep. They are near them to see how they are doing and uh, then uh, we they take care every time so they can start it send them in the forest try to get uh, vegetation no they are uh, they can be rescued when they are still young with even less than a year and then the caregivers can take the role of their mother so it means that they can be like surrogate mother so when we feel that these gorillas are strong enough and if you see that they are healthy then we can send them together in the same group with the other family. So it's how we go. And it's many steps which we follow to reach the integration. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. What intensive care during that first 40 days. And once the yeah, little gorillas are, are, are integrated into the family group, in that family group, I think, all groups, whether humans or gorillas or otherwise, they need good leaders. So which gorillas among the Grace group fulfill that role? So who are the leaders and have those leaders changed over time? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the leader can change. And uh, actually, uh, we have Kioma, who is the leader. And this can change uh, with different circumstances. You know, last time ago, Pinga was the leader and simple because he was the, the oldest female. And uh, Pinga was a family which from Rwanda because there was two families. The other family was from uh, Rwanda and the other one was in Goma. So when these gorillas came and Pinga was the oldest female, then he took the role of the leader. Symbol was because Kioma was still young, he could not lead the group. And then when Kioma was growing, then he fighted uh, Pinga 
and all the female and all the other small male, then he became the leader. Until now, Kioma is the leader and he's the boss of the family at Grace. Interesting, very interesting. Female leadership and then Kioma rising, growing yeah. up in the family group, become the silverback and the, and the leader. And, you know, they're very, you know, one of the things that strikes me is how cohesive the family group is, is at Grace with Kioma as the silverback. But he's also not the only male. You mentioned there were some younger males in the group and you know, the politics can be complicated in gorilla. So could another gorilla such as Lubutu challenge Kioma in the future or become favored by the other gorillas over Kioma? And if so, what would you do in that yes. situation? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, yes, yes, I agree that uh, uh, there is the other male and this male can challenge Kioma. And uh, yeah, there is Lubutu who is uh, uh, also a sub, a sub, a sub, a sub back and he's growing fast even now he have started uh, trying to challenge kioma because uh, we can see her, him sometime trying to divide the group yeah he have some female which have started following her and uh, he's trying to divide this group so yeah i think that uh, in the future if these uh, two male show us that they think that they should be in two groups then I think we should split this family to two for us in Gloja, just to avoid this fight because they can get much problem. They can even kill themselves. So as we are there as caregivers and if you are Vian who is taking care of them, we have to split them and go uh, to divide them to two uh, for us in Gloja. Yeah. So you're looking for the gorillas to tell you when it's time to split the group. You're looking to see if there is an increase in aggression. As so far, has there been a lot of aggression between Lubutu and Kioma? Yes, of course. Yeah, as I, I said before that Kyo, Lubutu is really uh, growing fast and soon he will be a self back. Really, there will be um, several fights because Lubutu will try to be the boss of the family and if Kioma will try to defend himself and to defend his family, then there will be really um, problems and wounds can come and even men can die. Yeah, because if you if, if a gorilla wants to be a boss of a family, he has to kill the male or the male submit to him. So I don't know if Kioma will submit easily near Lubutu or not. So, and then we are there to see all of that who are watching. If they, if they decide to show us then it's necessary then we will do know we have to split them yeah that is we think that we can solve that problem yeah so changes could be coming with the grace family i'm glad you're there to watch carefully and the gorillas at grace the, the family group it's we could call it a blended group because all the individuals came to grace from other family groups. They were all the result of the illegal wildlife trade that you spoke about above before. And so when there was no male leader before Kioma and the group was first established, you mentioned that Pinga was the adult female, was the leader. Can you tell us a little bit more about how she stepped up to fulfill this role? Okay, thank you. Yeah, as I said before, that uh, Pinga was the oldest female and Pinga is really a very good mother in the, our family of Grace. And uh, she has really a big role in this uh, family because she take care of uh, baby new gorillas. And last time uh, we had two female, no, a male and a female. The first one was Shamavu. And when we integrated Shamavu, Pinga was really there uh, to protect her. And he took her like her own, uh, not, uh, not uh, own gorilla, baby gorilla. And then when Shamavu was growing, then he tried to leave uh, Pinga. And then Pinga was not good, was not fine because she said, no, I lost my baby. And then after, Lulingu came and really 
she worked with her like a surrogate mother. So Pinga is really a very good gorilla with the baby gorillas. And uh, she, when she was a leader, really she was uh, taking care of all the family without any problem. And uh, even uh, uh, she's not happy when this uh, baby gorillas want to leave her uh, when they are growing. No, when the baby gorilla are growing, they are trying to go uh, to be independent. But Pinga really states that, no, you have to be near me. And really, Pinga is really, I don't know how I can explain, but Pinga is a good mother of these uh, other baby gorillas. Yeah. Very key to the success of the family. Um, <laughs> yeah, we have yeah. another question here, Dalmas, about innovation and humans aren't the only creature that has the ability to innovate. So maybe we could hear a little bit about Itabera. She's one of the few gorillas that's been documented to use tools. When she was an infant in your care, she was um, observed using rocks as a hammer and anvil to crack palm nuts. So while she's been at Grace, has Itabera displayed her intelligence and tool use in other ways? Do you think the other gorillas have learned from ah, her? Yeah. Ah, yes, really, Titebero is a, a really clever gorilla, as I always say. And uh, this uh, uh, behavior have changed to the one who he have started using the, the sticks. When Titebero is in, a night, in the night house, if he saw a food which is far from him, if he cannot be able to, to get this food, then he can found a stick of a tree and try to get mm -hmm. Uh, this food and then when the food is really near him then he can take this and a pinga is also one of the gorilla which uh, he learned much about training and if uh, there is a enrichment a new enrichment she's the one who can be the first to test this enrichment really she's really clever gorilla until now she is there and then um, uh, as you asked if she have trained the other one, yes, of course, she have trained the other one. There is other uh, free gorillas like Mapendo, Jingala, Isanki. They have learned from uh, from Itebero to use this uh, this stick of tree, getting the food which are far from them. Oh, that's fascinating. Fascinating. Thank you, Dalmas. So yeah. all the gorillas at Grace are orphaned due to poaching, and so they've all suffered physical and emotional trauma at a young age. And we, we could spend a lot of time talking about each individual gorilla's story, but we'd like to talk a little bit about Amani. You know, Amani had a bullet lodged in her leg when she was rescued, and she still walks with a limp. So could you tell us a little bit more about Amani, what her personality is like, and and how she fits into the group. Okay, thank you. Talking about Amani, and uh, Amani is my really special gorilla for me, and uh, she's uh, uh, my favorite gorilla, if I can introduce like that. You know, Amani is special because she was the first to welcome me when I started working with gorilla. It was uh, uh, 2010 in Goma, I started working with them. And Amani was the one who came uh, in front of me and I started to interacting with her. And really she's special and I like her very much. And uh, Amani uh, is a really peaceful gorilla, as her name say, means. She never provoke fight in the family. She's calm. If a gorilla come to try to fight her, she'll say, okay, I can leave you. If a gorilla want to grab her to take his food, she'll say, okay, you can take my food, I'm fine. And really, she's a very good gorilla and she's a good learner. About training, she's a really a good learner of training. And the other gorillas can really try to learn from her about training. And how does she fit into the group? I know you. some of the data you've been collecting is on the proximity how gorillas choose to spend time next to each other. How does Amani fit in that pattern? Ah, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, Amani really, as I said, she's fine with everyone. And in the group, she's 
everywhere. She's really with everyone. If we can do this collection data, she can be sleeping with everyone. She can be near everyone. She's really a central gorilla in the family. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. And so, yeah. Damas, we've been hearing about how you work directly with the gorillas. But one question people like to ask is, how do you communicate with the gorillas? How do you do? You speak to them? Do you use gestures or both? How, how do you communicate with the gorillas in your work? Okay. Yeah. In my work, I use really like a gesture or I can communicate directly with them. Yeah, you know, especially when I'm doing training, I the first thing I to do, I can call them by my say, okay, like Amani, come here. Then he understand and then she will come. Then, then I can start uh, doing just to, you know, uh, as uh, we have always doing training, then I can say Amani, the, the, then there I can start with just to, I can say hands up. When I do my hands up, it means the gorilla will put also his hands up, then he will understand. I can ask the gorilla the shooter, then I'll, I'll use the shooter like this. Then the gorilla shows the shooter. And when I do this, it's the in the subject of, of injection. Then the gorilla understand that when I ask the shooter, then it's injection and they know that. And all the training we do, we do them with subject. I can say, okay, then you can show the, the, you can show the, the, the chest. The chest means that I'll take the stethoscope to show how the is breathing and really some things. I, yeah, we have many uh, training which we can do with gorillas. Like we can take temperature on them. We can really, we have taught them. So we've just seen really the gorillas also understand uh, easily. And yeah, really it's how we do, yeah. Wonderful. So, and this training that you do the training every day and does this part form part of the daily health checks for the gorillas? Yes, we do this uh, every day. You know, as a, actually, uh, when we have a problem of COVID-19, we could be taking the temperature every day to see what's happening with the gorillas. The gorillas are, are okay or not. As the same we do for our people, we also do that when gorillas are taking the temperature. So the, this training is uh, doing every day and at the same time, or, yeah, you can do it in morning, you can do it in midday or in evening, really. Yeah, we work with them closely and it's time to, it's a good time to interact with the gorillas. Yeah. Interesting, very interesting. So the great gorillas have yeah. very large enclosures or habitats, we call them, where they can roam and find food and, and play. But since they're still within, even though we have this huge forest area, it's still a fixed space. So how does the Grace team ensure that their diet is healthy? And have you noticed that individual okay. gorillas might have their favorite foods? Yes, yes. You know, as we have worked with gorillas uh, many years, and uh, we know that the gorilla prefers uh, certain foods. Yeah, as uh, I know, as you have introduced that they can go in forest to get their own food. And uh, our job is that to see which food we can collect outside of the forest, which is not in the forest enclosure. We have also provided a farm in which we can uh, grow different vegetables. We have like beetroot, we have radish, we have... Uh, onion, we produce also cabbage, and then we can bring them to Gorilla. And apart that, according to that, we have a protocol, uh, we have a schedule on which we show that each Gorilla should be eating this food. Uh, we know that uh, this Gorilla can take like two fruits a day or four fruits. He can get uh, radish, he can really have this protocol and each caregiver knows what kind of food each gorilla can take a day and pay feeding so it's how we we do that and uh, we also relied on our nutritionists uh, in us which can advise us on how we can also uh, do other uh, give other food which can provide 
like uh, protein, like other things. And then we have also provided the, the biscuits, which we, we, we can produce, we make in our local um, local ingredients, like sorghum or, or, or peanut butter. We put also like palm oil, oil, and then we make our own biscuit, which we give to gorillas and the gorilla like them very much. And they really, our gorillas are healthy because of that, because we know how to work on a different thing, different food, which can help them to grow fastly and with good health. Yeah, that's how. Wonderful. And do any of the gorillas have favorite foods? Yeah, each one has his favorite food. Uh, for example, I can give the favorite food of Kioma. Kioma like very much the wild banana. <laughs> and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. there is our Itebero who likes the cabbage. And when we bring the cabbage in the night house, really, he starts sinking when he sees that food. They are saying, mm -hmm, and then really, it's really funny for these guys. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So one final question, yeah. Damas. I think we can see through your answers how much you enjoy your work, but what what particularly do you enjoy about your work at Grace as the care manager? Yeah, my really my particular thing, uh, time I enjoy my work is uh, when I'm doing training, because when I'm doing the training, it's my most time when I can be close to the gorillas, especially my my favorite gorilla, Amani. And, uh, you know, the training, as I've explained before, that uh, uh, we do more uh, several training with different subjects. And the gorillas, uh, when they react uh, positively, when I ask the behavior which I need to do, and then they do. Really, well, at that time, I'm very happy when I can see that. Uh, also, when I can watch them playing in the forest enclosure, they behave like in wild, when they are getting fresh food, they can really get everything they want in the forest. Yeah. In addition, you know, I also help the, the, the gorilla. Uh, I'm devoted to help them, the helpers of gorillas, who are uh, poaching and with illegal hand. I feel fine to help the, giving them the second chance to live. Wonderful. Thank you ever so much, yeah. Damas, for giving us an insight into, into your work and the gorillas at Grace. Okay, I thank you. That was Damas Kakuli Sangeha, the animal care manager at Grace. I want to thank Dalmas for taking the time to share his knowledge and love of gorillas with everyone. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Katie Fawcett for helping with that interview. Uh, Katie, thanks again for sticking around. Uh, we got a lot of viewer questions uh, to get to, and I have a couple of additional questions I want to get to as well. Um, listening in, in, to, to Dalmas speak was very educational for me because he has that, like, that hands-on experience with the gorillas on a daily basis. Uh, we did hear him talk about, you know, the potential for conflict between Kioma, who's currently the silverback, and Lubutu, who is a younger male that potentially could challenge Kioma uh, for dominance in the future. Uh, and the Grace group, uh, like you and he have mentioned, you know, they currently live together in a single family group. As, uh, as, as part of the process to provide for their welfare, Dalmas, as I understand it, he watches their relationships between the gorillas for any changes. So uh, somebody was wondering, since you have um, a, a single family group, that was one of the, the questions uh, somebody came uh, wrote in with, how many groups are our Grace? There's just one. But could you explain just a little bit more about the steps that Grace is taking to anticipate changes in group dynamics, especially is there if there is a challenge for dominance? Yeah, thank you, Mike. Definitely, it's a subject of lots of our discussions and um like the viewers on the explore cam we're watching very carefully to see how the relationship develops so the first thing that the team noticed was that lubutu seemed to be kind of like hanging back in the group when he went out into the uh, when they go out into the forest and uh, enclosures and he's his attention kind of turned towards the outside of the group 
So kind of looking more at what's going on around him rather than like being involved in the group dynamics. And then slowly, sometimes he'll, he'll go in the forest in one direction and a few of the females will go with him. But at night, they're all coming back together and um, being, being one family group. Um, and it's been really peaceful. And this has been going on now for over a couple of years. We've been watching this change in dynamic. So it's subtle. However, we're ready that change could happen at any time and that it might be a very quick decision. So the care team's looking very carefully for any signs of, of aggression. We'll always let the gorillas decide when it's time to, to separate. Um, and as you know, we have two forest enclosures right now. So an immediate plan would, would be we'd be able to, to separate the gorillas into two enclosures. And then another piece that Dalmas talked about too is not only do we go very closely by the, the observations of the care staff, but the care staff are also collecting data on social relationships. So we can that's been another nice tool to help with communications and to chart changes over time. And and right now it's very much one cohesive family still. But we're watching very closely. And you have the, the intention of rewilding the gorillas that are currently under your care. Uh, how might that, that process work and what conditions you say, hey, go, go, go be free wild gorillas once again? I think there's really like two, two different aspects. First is what we're doing with the gorillas at Grace is the rehabilitation process. So we did extremely well on having a successful family group resocializing, growing up gorilla, if you like, from the, the young age that the gorillas have come into our care. And then in the large forest habitats, being able to learn to forage for food, to range, to build nests, all these we call survival critical skills um, to be able to return um, to the forest. The other piece of that is the forest or the habitat. We have to ensure that the conditions which led to the gorillas being in our care have, have changed. So we need to have protected forest environment. And then also we follow best practice guidelines, which is first do no harm. So we also want to look for forests which are in effect empty forests from other great apes. So areas where we wouldn't be at risk of introducing a disease into a wild population. So as you know, gorillas and humans are very closely related and these gorillas at Grace have now been in very close human contact. Um, so with any great ape re release project, these are the factors that we want to um, be mitigating for as we, we prepare our, our plans. So we're still very much in the planning phase um, for any such project. I should have mentioned this at the beginning of the broadcast, just a little bit about the different types of gorillas there are in the world. Um, one of the first questions that we had come in earlier um, was about uh, the the type of gorillas that that you have. Are somebody was wondering are these considered lowland gorillas? So you can talk about maybe the difference between the different types of gorillas and what's the current status of the growers gorillas that are cared for at Grace. So that's that's a great question. So there's there's two species um, for subspecies of four types of gorillas. Um, I think the gorillas that everybody knows very well from the zoos in North America are the Western lowland gorillas, which are found in, um, it's not surprising, in the Western and Central Africa. There's also a very tiny population of cross river gorillas um, that are on the, up, up in the borders with uh, Cameroon. Um, and then the gorilla that most of our research and knowledge has come from and uh, that Diane Fossey started studies on in the Virunga volcanoes are the mountain gorillas, the hairy gorillas. And then the gorillas we have at Grace are probably one of the uh, least known um, gorillas, and that's Grauer's gorillas, also known as Eastern Lowland gorillas. And there's around 6,800 gorillas from the recent estimate of Grauer's gorillas remaining, but they're, they're considered critically endangered. They've gone through like catastrophic decline of 80% of their population has been decimated in just one generation. So they're, they're high, highly threatened, the, the Grauer gorillas, as all gorillas are throughout Africa. Yeah, and I think that underscores how important every individual is in their overall 
um, survival and why the, the work that's done at Grace is, is so important for this species. Uh, one person, another person was wondering a little bit about, again, group dynamics. We do have a lot of questions sort of about that. Uh, somebody was wondering, has there been uh, new gorillas who were not accepted into the group? As, I, as far as I understand, that's not been the case. They've all been sort of like welcomed almost with, with open arms, to use a, a human analogy. Yeah, I think that's one of the huge successes at Grace is integrating gorillas into the gorilla family from a, from as soon as possible. Gorillas want to be with other gorillas, um, and that you know that process to date has gone really smoothly at Grace. One one thing that's different about the Grace group, though, is uh, you don't see any infants uh, right now. Um, you don't mm. see any babies. Um, and we do have a few questions about that. Is somebody was wondering about breeding? Is that a plan for the group? Or somebody else was wondering, are the females at Grace on, on birth control? Cause, so can you talk a little bit about um, how you're managing their numbers? Because you do have a limited amount of space, of course, for the gorillas at Grace. So how, it, how does that process work? What's that decision process like and, and what's involved? Yeah, no, ex you're exactly uh, right, Mike, that we have limited space. And so as a sanctuary, we focus on being able to provide the space and care for the individuals in our care. And so all of the female gorillas are on birth control, um, just like humans, one pill a day. Um, and that's really so that we can um, focus on the gorillas that are within our care and is a general requirement for um, accredited sanctuaries. I think Thomas, just to add to that, me, sorry, one of the ahead. other aspects, sorry, I was going to say to add to that, I think it's also notable that not many gorillas, infant gorillas have been rescued in recent years. Um, so Lulingu was the, the most recent rescue. And we, you know, we'd like to take that to be a good news story from the world. Um, but, you know, with such few numbers and the gorillas are so, um, uh, unevenly distributed in in pockets. It's um, it's 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 surprising that the number of rescued gorillas coming into the sanctuary has been so low recently because we know that um, chimpanzees in the area and bonobos in Congo their numbers have have continued to be increasing of, of rescued gorilla, uh, great apes. It seems like. Uh... You know, the staff at Grace have a very close relationship with the gorillas under their care. Uh, and and some, someone wrote in about that relationship, uh, wondering maybe more in general um, about how that works. Uh, so the question is, what sort of relationship do the gorillas have with humans? And do they tolerate humans observing them and intervening when is required? It sounds like the gorillas mm -hmm. are very habituated to the presence of people and, and particularly to certain individuals. Yeah, and um, they have the, the, the human caregivers have a really close relationship with the gorillas. And I should say was, whereas gorillas want to be in gorilla groups, that process after the initial quarantine pe period of, of caring for individual gorillas is very hard on the human caregivers. Um, but I think what seeing the gorillas in their gorilla group brings a lot of sat satisfaction. And whilst the caregivers at Grace don't have that direct contact in the group, as Dan Mass was mentioning, I often hear how much communication there is during the training that the caregivers do with the gorillas every day. So as Dan Mass was explaining, they, the gorillas um, are trained every day to pre presenting their hands for inspection, feet, um, respiration rate. Um, so I think that there's a, that's a very intimate bond between the trainer and the, the individual gorilla at that time. And certainly some of the gorillas ha have more of an interest in humans, particularly those that spent a long time before coming to Grace, perhaps in, in human care or in situations with humans um, before they were able to get interact integrated into the gorilla group. Going back to the gorillas themselves, uh, you know, they're they're with each other, sounds like 24 hours a day. 
so how how are the gorillas themselves communicating with each other? That's another question that somebody wrote in. Mm, yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. So, and the, the gorillas you know, communicate through vocalizations, um, through choosing who they'd like to be with, and um, in their association patterns, or that's how we can see their their, um, their behavioral behavioral choices. I think what you can see on the explore cam, and we always try and give a heads up as much as we can, is when the gorillas move from one enclosure to another, then you can see them um, when they come across the freshly re the regrowth um, in the new enclosure. The gorillas do um, a vocalization called singing or humming which is their enjoyment of, of, of feeding with the new gorilla, uh, with the new, the new food. You can also see that gorillas on the life can sometimes chest beating or displaying, <coughs> excuse me, um, which is an, another way of, of communicating. Or here you can see Kioma showing his strength and size. There we go. <laughs> that stiff body posture and then standing up um, and beating his chest. The, the chest beating itself, I, that's, um, you know, it's, a, it's like a stereotyped sort of like vision that people have of, of gorillas. But could you explain a little bit more about what, what the purpose of that is? Yeah, well, it's really fascinating. So I think the gorillas really use it, the male gorillas to communicate with other male gorillas, maybe in other group. It's, it can travel long distances between, between groups. But then also it's been studied um as a sign of like strength for individual gorillas and and females can use it also as a way of assessing and, and making those choices about which silverback or which group they would like to to reside with um one of the things is yeah well, okay. Thanks for um, helping me better understand that behavior. You see it basically like every image of a gorilla, like in a cartoon or whatever it happens to be, will have a gorilla beating their chest. So I think it's a, it's an interesting yeah, behavior, so when, but I was yeah, yeah, I, curious to learn a little bit more and, about it. And so when two gorilla groups will come together, you'll see the silverbacks from each gorilla group come forward and display. And just like we saw in the video there, they might start just by showing their size that stiff leg strut, um, and they can assess each other. And sometimes they'll spend hours just kind of looking at each other from this side and from that side. And then the two groups might just move apart. But as you can see, like gorillas are made for fighting, that, um, that size, the teeth. Um, but the interactions can be, as Dama said, it's really aggressive. But because of that, they're extremely rare. So. The chest beating is what we call an honest signal for, for gorillas to, to, to share information between different, uh, between gorilla, but between different males and also for the females to learn. Um, but also you'll see, uh, you know, maybe in films, that would be how the gorilla would protect itself from a, a poaching or a human interaction. Um, and then you'll also see that gorillas from like the age they can walk almost, They'll practice it. They'll play as a as a play behavior. So getting used to uh, these behaviors and part of the wrestling that goes on with with young males as they as they grow up. Well, it must be it must be fascinating um, to watch, and it uh, and uh, you know that's an opportunity we have to do a little bit through the live cams uh, at the Grace facility on explore.org. Question now about the. Uh, a little bit more about group dynamics. Um, you know, we talked uh, much about this earlier in the broadcast, uh, but uh, somebody had a follow-up question to some of the questions that I had. Uh, so this person writes in, when the silverback dies, does one of his sons take over if old enough? Or could there be, um, and I'm adding on to their question, could there be sort of like a vacancy where another wandering male gorilla could just be there in the right place at the right time? Yeah, that's a great question. So I mentioned that when the silverbacks mature, they, they may stay in their natal group um, and they would become like a, a silverback leader in waiting, if you like. So maybe it, their decisions could be influenced a little bit by how old the silverback, the current leader of the group is. And certainly females may choose when they're making their decisions to move from one group 
to another group, to move to a group that has more than one male, because potentially that group will have a, a longer tenure so that if the older male dies, the younger male can inherit the group um, and the group structure stays, you know, the group remains um, cohesive. But if the silver, if there's only one silverback, it's unlikely, it's possible, I guess, a lone silverback could walk in at the right moment and take the females um, or maybe challenge an older male. Um, but often the group would just disintegrate with the females going in different directions to, to join other, other males or other groups. And uh, a couple more questions here, Katie, before we allow you to enjoy uh, your evening. Uh, this is about the Grace uh, Sanctuary itself. Somebody is wondering how long has the Grace Sanctuary been in existence and is it in any way related to the Diane Fossey Foundation? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the Grace Sanctuary was um, started by the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. Um, and the first gorillas arrived in 2010, I believe. Um, um, and then since the, uh, following the establishment of the sanctuary, it's become its own entity, focusing um, its own organization, Grace, focusing on the gorillas at the sanctuary and in the surrounding wild populations. So we like to think we're in like my... a baby of Diane Fossey. <laughs> well, that's a, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's big shoes to fill for sure. Uh, my final question for you, uh, Katie, is how can we help the team at Grace, the gorillas, and uh, the people who live in and around gorilla habitat? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Mike. And I think everyone's doing it right now. Um, I think learning as much as you can about gorillas, the gorillas at Grace, gorilla conservation, um, and then sharing that knowledge and with others. Um, and you can stay up to date through the live cam and through our social media platforms. Um, that's great. You know, that, I think that's a wonderful thing that we can all do and we're all doing already. We also have Earth Month coming up in April, where lots of um, initiatives in local zoos for recycling electronics. So the minerals which are found in all of our electronics are mined from the gorilla habitat in Eastern Congo. So the more that we can do to reuse the minerals within all of our cell phones and, and other electronics, um, the more that that can help with habitat protection for wild gorillas. Well, this has been a, a really fun program to participate in, uh, Katie. Uh, so thanks so much for your time. I think that's a great note to end the program on. And so, yeah, thanks for being here and sharing all your knowledge of, of the gorillas. Well, thank you very much, Mike. It was a pleasure. That was uh, Dr. Katie Fawcett, the program manager for Grace. Uh, we also saw her interview with Dalmas Kakuli Sangeha, the animal care manager at Grace. And I want to thank him for taking the time out of his day to share his knowledge and love of the gorillas with everybody. If you want to learn more about uh, Grace and their their work, please go to their website, uh, gracegorillas.org. That's G-R-A-C-E gorillas.org. And you can watch the gorillas uh, every day on explore.org. Just go to explore.org slash gorillas. You can tune in uh, in for me, on the East Coast of North America, it's usually pretty good in the morning, maybe between 9 and 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time, but sometimes it's a little bit earlier in the day as well. So check it out. Um, really fun to watch the gorillas. And we also have uh, volunteer opportunities at Explode.org. So if you wanted to be a camera operator for, let's say, a Grace Gorilla Cam, we have that available uh, as well. Go to Explode.org slash volunteer to find out more. My name is Mike Fitz with Explode.org. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And as we like to say at explore.org, never stop learning.